Hi, my name is Graham Hatful. I'm a professor at the University of Pittsburgh and a Howard Hughes Medical Institute professor. Um, in part two, we're going to talk about some of the insights that we can gain from uh, comparing the genomes of bacteriophages uh, and perhaps learn something about how they're constructed and how they have evolved. In part one, we um, saw some morphologies of bacteriophages, what they look like in the electron microscope, um, and I showed you some different types of structures um, that could arguably uh, reflect different ways in which those bacteriophages have evolved. But we have to be very careful about um, interpreting differences in virion morphology, what the viruses look like, and their evolutionary relationships and how the genomes compare to each other. And I've illustrated that in this particular slide where I've shown five examples of bacteriophages. Um, these would all be classified according to their long uh, flexible tails as being members of the cypherviridae, their cypherviruses, each with their heads and their tails attached. It might be uh, tempting to look at these and say, well, they all look very similar to each other, almost indistinguishable. Um, perhaps they all are genetically similar. And in fact, this is an example where these five share essentially little or no um, uh, sequence similarity at the genomic level whatsoever. So if we want to understand how genomes have evolved and how they are related to each other from a phylogenetic perspective, we need to go in, isolate the DNA, and sequence those genomes, and then compare them. There are various ways in which we can compare the genomic sequences. We can compare them by looking at the similarities of the nucleotide sequences, essentially sequencing the DNA, or if it's RNA, the, the, the RNA, and then comparing them one to another and seeing what is shared. Um, a second way of doing that would be to look at the genes and comparing them through their predicted amino acid sequence similarities of the proteins that are encoded by those genes. Right here, I'm showing you an example of what it looks like if we take two bacteriophages and compare their nucleotide sequences. And this particular representation is referred to as a dot plot. And what we've done is to take two bacteriophage genomes, in this case, Fruit Loop and Boomer, and we have aligned the two sequences, and we're going to slide one next to the other, computationally, and ask if there are segments uh, that are similar to each other within a particular window of comparison. And every time we see sequence similarity, um, a, a dot is presented on this dot plot. Um, and what you can see here is, is that there's a rather complex series of relationships um, reflecting uh, a, a, a quasi-diagonal line from the top left to the bottom right of this uh, representation. So where you can see a relatively solid line, that means that there's a segment of DNA which is uh, substantially similar between the two. Where you fail to see a line, such as in the top left-hand corner, is a region where the two genomes appear to be substantially dissimilar, they don't have shared nucleotide sequences. Um, and then there's all sorts of complicated um, interruptions and shifts in the diagonal line um, as you look between these. And this uh, tells us an important aspect, a component of what we see when we compare these types of genomes. And that is, um, they are not simply completely similar from end to end or completely dissimilar from end to end. But quite commonly, we see these interrupted portions where different segments of the genomes uh, are related to each other in different ways, as though different parts of the genome have different evolutionary histories, different ways of arriving in the genomes as we see them in Fruit Loop and Boomer today. So um, from this type of analysis and looking at a number of bacteriophage genomes, um, we can see uh, the following general conclusions. First of all, the DNA that is isolated from these particular 
virions, these double-stranded DNA virus uh, types, uh, that the genomes are linear. So they have a, def they have a, a, a left end and a right end. Um, they tend to form uh, predominantly two types of, of, of groups that we can see when we look at the linear genomes. There are those that have defined ends. That means that if you isolate the molecules from a million particles of a particular phage type, each of the million DNA molecules that you get out have the same left and right ends. In other cases, that's not true. Um, the DNAs have the same overall genetic constitution, but the specific physical ends of the left and the right can be positioned in different places, and therefore they're referred to as being circularly permuted. They're not circular, they're linear, um, but they represent positioning different positions of the ends relative to the genetic information. Often these viruses also contain um, terminal redundancies, which means that one segment of the genome is duplicated at both ends. And so these two major types of genomes that you see um, are either have defined ends or terminally redundant and circularly permuted ends. Uh, and there are other viruses um, that have different variations uh, on these themes. The sizes of bacteriophage genomes varies enormously. There are those that are as small as perhaps 5,000 bases, and there are those that are as large as 500 uh, kilobases, um, which is quite amazing when you think that 500 kilobases is about the size of the smaller of the free-living um, bacterial genomes. And so there are examples of viruses that are the same size genomically and have the same or more genes as small, um, small bacterial genomes. The phage genomes tend to be densely packed with genes, and so most of the DNA is, is encoding genes. Um, and, and as I mentioned before in this section, that, that phages infecting bacteria from different genera uh, tend to be unrelated at the DNA level. So this slide shows an example of what we see when we take a DNA sequence of a particular phage. In this case, it's a phage called Giles. And we use computational approaches um, in a, a, a bioinformatic strategy to identify the protein coding genes that are present within the virus. And so um, uh, the genome is largely filled with protein coding genes. And they're shown here by these uh, boxes, um, either colored or in, or in white. The genome is represented by what looks like this railroad track here, um, which uh, has markers every kilobase and every hundred bases. And the genome for Giles is linear with defined ends. And so in this representation, it begins in the top left-hand corner and goes to the bottom right-hand corner. Um, and each of the genes are shown as these boxes represented either above or below the DNA. Genes that are shown above the DNA are transcribed in the rightwards direction over this way and those that are shown below such as a couple of genes or three genes in the top left hand corner um, are transcribed in the leftwards direction. So those are the um, uh, standards that we use for presenting the genes and illustrating um, the direction that they're transcribed relative to the overall genome structure. You can see here from these genes that they are densely packed into, these, uh, into this particular genome. There's few non-coding spaces between the genes. Um, they essentially uh, represent 95% or more of the genetic information uh, that's available. In this particular representation, we've uh, colored the genes in such a way as to reflect the relationships that some of these genes share with genes that you find in other bacteriophages. The genes that are shown in white, um, and you can see some across the top here, are simply genes for which we don't have any other close relatives um, in any of the databases. And this illustrates the point um, that phages such as this uh, can be replete with genes um, 
that are not closely related to known genes and for which we have rather little idea as to what they do. I mentioned that uh, when we compare the nucleotide sequences of phages, we can see that it looks as though the parts um, have evolved differently to each other. And this leads to the idea that phage genomes are characteristically mosaic. They are constructed architecturally from segments which have been put together in a particular way, modules if you like, and that each of these modules is in effect um, mobile or can move around the population of bacteriophages such that you can find it in more than one or perhaps several different genomic contexts. And this slide illustrates how this might look when you see a mosa mosaicism at the level of nucleotide sequence comparisons. So this is showing a small segment of three phage genomes, uh, one at the top, PG1, rosebush in the middle, and quersula towards the bottom. You can see the genome represented by the markers and the railroad tracks for each of these. The genes that are encoded are shown by the color boxes with their gene names inside the boxes. And where these genomes contain and share nucleotide sequence similarity, uh, there's a color-coded area, uh, a shading between the two, such as you can see here. Now, rosebush and quersula have very evident and, and strong nucleotide sequence similarity, both in the left part here and over here in the right part as well. PG1 and rosebush and quersula uh, have no sequence similarity that's evident by this comparison uh, in this example because there's no color shading over on this left part here. Nonetheless, in this middle segment, things are different. There appears to be very little sequence similarity between rosebush and quersula um, because there's no uh, shading in that area. However, when we compare PG1 and rosebush, we can see that in this central segment right here that there is indeed the purple color shading that, that reflects strong sequence similarity between these two genomes, PG1 and rosebush, in this center portion. So this is really important because it illustrates an example where the different segments of these genomes, particularly rosebush, appear to have had different evolutionary histories. They've come from different places. This segment that's in the middle of rosebush clearly did not come from the same place as Quersula. Um, it appears to have come from a common ancestor which had more in common in this region with PG1. So this is a good example of mosaicism, a key architectural feature of bacteriophage genomes. When you look at the nucleotide sequence level, you can see precisely where these types of events occur, at the boundaries that must reflect where recombination occurred to give you this exchange of information. And in this particular slide, I'm showing the detailed information of, of two uh, genomes. Uh, one at the top here, you can see the sequences, and in blue, the amino acid sequences of the predicted genes in that region. In the bottom, you can see a second genome that we're comparing. And this red shading over on the right-hand side uh, is simply reflecting a segment where these genomes are closely related. The nucleotide sequences, the DNAs, are extremely similar, if not identical in this red part. But over here, they're completely different. They're completely dissimilar. And so the key point that you can see from this type of comparison, that this module boundary, this junction between the red and the white parts where recombination must have happened, this module boundary corresponds precisely to the boundaries of the genes. It is this boundary which is where this gene starts up here, and, uh, and its uh, comparable gene begins down here. These genes to the left are very different, and to the right they're identical. So the module boundary, or the recombinant joint, which must have brought these together, coincides with the gene boundaries themselves. 
And this is a common and important observation, and it helps us to think about how mosaicism can be generated. And there's two fundamental models. The first is that recombination happens at targeted, short, conserved boundary sequences. The idea that there's some short, conserved segment of sequences, perhaps a dozen or a couple of dozen nucleotides in length, which corresponds to those boundary regions. And that homologous recombination, perhaps encoded by host enzymes, catalyzes exchange at that region in order to promote recombination at places where the genes themselves in their entirety get exchanged. There are some examples of that in the, uh, that have been reported in the literature. So this is certainly an event that can happen. We think, however, that it's more likely that mu much of the mosaicism that you see, because it is this pervasive feature throughout phage genomes, can occur by an alternative mechanism, which is by illegitimate recombination at what are essentially randomly chosen sequences. In other words, that even though we see a close correspondence between the point of recombination and gene boundaries, this does not result by this model from targeted exchange at that point. Rather that the exchange positions are random and the reason why that correspondence occurs is because of selection for gene function, for those genes that can actually work. And so this just illustrates um, the different types of examples of recombination. Um, in the top panel, one could imagine that targeted recombination, um, targeted homologous recombination, could occur at these short um, black segments, short segments of DNA that are conserved at gene boundaries in order to give you these exchange events and these recombinants. This middle panel here shows an example of illegitimate recombination where recombination has essentially happened anywhere. It's happened between sequences that are not related to each other and you get whatever gobbledygook may arise from just a random exchange process. And at the bottom here, I, I want to emphasize that we do expect uh, recombination to occur between shared sequences, such as whole genes that are shared. Um, homologous recombination of this sort always happens, and it gives you new combinations of flanking genes, such as A, now joined together with C. Okay? So homologous recombination is always going to play a role in reassorting the types of genes that can be present in modules. But homologous recombination of this general type does not generate new recombinant boundaries, new module boundaries, um, unless it's in this targeted approach. So as I mentioned, we think that whereas there are a small number of examples that would support the uh, exchange at boundary sequences, by far the majority of the boundaries that we see when we compare phage genomes uh, show no evidence of such boundary sequences, um, lending support to the idea that illegitimate recombination is playing a key role. But there are some really important uh, consequences that we have to think about as a model for illegitimate recombination in this process. First of all, illegitimate recombination recombination between sequences that don't share anything uh, or very little in common is likely to happen at rather low frequencies. Um, it's going to occur at random positions for the most part. And that when you put together two pieces of DNA randomly, for the most part, it's just going to generate genomic garbage. Um, material which, which may not have a genome of the appropriate length and will have lost some genes uh, and is liable to be non-functional. So in its essence, we can think of it as a rather disru dis disruptive um, or destructive uh, type of process. And one can imagine that if this was going to play an important role, that you'd probably need multiple low frequency events um, in order to actually generate uh, survivors. The, the phoenix that can rise from the ashes with a full complement of functional sequences uh, that can function as a virus. If sequences are going to recombine randomly with each other, um, then 
there's no necessity to think of these events as being predominantly evolving, in, involving two phage genomes. The bacterial chromosome is about 100 times the size of an average bacteriophage genome, and therefore there's going to be a strong propensity, or, or at least an opportunity, for the phage genome to recombine with a bacterial chromosome. Um, the process um, we can think of as being one that is infrequent and yet extremely creative. This is the way in which you can take pieces of DNA and put them together in a way in which has perhaps never been seen before in nature. That's a way of making new genes, of perhaps putting domains together in novel combinations, and generating new types of functions which perhaps have been not seen in nature before. And so um, this fits in very much with a, a model as described by Darwin for the process of um, the origin of species, where we can think of the variation being generated by these illegitimate recombination events, and then natural selection working on what is essentially this garbage in order to select from that those components that work. Even though we would think of this as being a very low frequency event requiring uh, infrequent recombination events and multiple numbers of them, it's nonetheless it is creative and as we saw um, uh, previously that uh, phages have likely been recombined, likely to been evolving for um, many, many years in a very dynamic population uh, very successfully. So this will give us these recombinant joints. These recombinant joints, once they're formed, are likely to be stably maintained. There's no mechanism necessarily for undoing them. And therefore, these survive, as we see today, as the fossilized relics of recombination events that probably happened um, many uh, hundreds of millions or even billions of years ago. In thinking about the mechanisms by which this might happen, um, it's been shown that many bacteriophages, ba bacteriophages encode recombinase enzymes, which have the capability to recombine genomes, uh, at least at very short sequences um, that don't have to be completely identical uh, to themselves, uh, raising the interesting possibility that bacteriophages actually encode their own machinery that can facilitate uh, this type of recombination and indeed the generation of the mosaic genomes as we see them. Looking at uh, bacteriophages uh, that are very different in their sequences uh, is quite limited to each other uh, and this uh, shows us that if we really want to learn more about the details of how mosaicism uh, is created and how it works, we really have to think about and very carefully about what types of genomes uh, we want to compare uh, with each other. And we'll see an example of that uh, in part three. So we can conclude then from this genomic comparison uh, of, of phages, we can conclude that phage genomes are architecturally mosaic, that mosaicism is fueled by this process of illegitimate recombination and that genome segments um, can eventually be reassorted by homologous recombination once new joints between new genes are generated to form that mosaicism. In part three, we'll look at a rather particular case of the detailed analysis of bacteriophages that infect one particular common host, where all those bacteriophages can be argued to be potentially in genetic communication with each other, and we can therefore explore what they look like and the insights that they can give us uh, in bacteriophage evolution.